Uh, welcome back from lunch. I hope it, you were able to get some nutrition and maybe a walk in, rejuvenate yourself um, and get ready to settle in and listen to a great presentation. With us this afternoon, we have Michael Phillips. Uh, he is renowned for helping people grow healthy fruit using herbal protocols. The community orchard movement that he helped found at groworganicapples.com provides a full immersion into the holistic approach to orcharding. His Lost Nation Orchard is part of a medicinal herb farm in northern New Hampshire. Michael is the author of The Apple Grower and the Holistic Orchard, which received Garden Book of the Year honors from the American Horticultural Society. And his work has been compared to Sir Albert Howard and J.I. Rodale's classic books on organic gardening. He teamed up with his wife Nancy to write The Herbalist's Way to explore the many paths whereby herbalists find their great niche. Michael's latest book, Mycorrhizal Planet, How Fungi and Plants Work Together to Create Dynamic Soils, will rock you. Um, and we do, for our door prize drawings at the end of the day, have the book, Mycorrhizal Planet, available that we'll give away to somebody. So we're excited about that. Um, just some brief Zoom etiquette here at the beginning. Please keep yourselves on mute uh, while Michael's speaking. If you have questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll be moderating the questions at the end. And if you want to uh, turn on your mic and speak at that point, um, yeah, we'll, we'll all call on you. So yeah, thank you very much. And we'll let you take off. Thank you, Michael. Hey, well, thank you, Ryan. Hello, Kansas. I, I was telling Ryan that um, I've been to Kansas a good couple dozen times because my wife, Nancy, is from Belleville up in North Central Kansas. So. I've seen your landscape and uh, we're in an entirely different place here in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So today I wanna get into kind of putting a face on mycorrhizal fungi, uh, getting to know better one of those super organisms that plays such a critical role on life on earth being a living planet. And mm -hmm. there's much we could talk about and I'll try to condense it and keep the things rolling because I wanna do a few practical insights at the end uh, so without further ado, let me just get the screen set up here and I should be good. And so I will talk <laughs> about mycorrhizae, um, the fungal element, the living nature of the soil. So just to start, kick us off here, that word mycorrhiza, um, the Greek roots of that word, myco, indicating the fungal kingdom, rhiza, indicating the root systems of plants. And they're brought together because mycorrhizal fungi are not like a separate thing. They have to have that dynamic, that union going on with plants for all the different things that I'm going to talk about to take place. And mycorrhizal fungi are part of that whole big soil food web scene. Many of you are familiar with that. This is the uh, acetomycetes and the bacteria and the separate trophic fungi that break down organic matter, thereby releasing minerals that plants can take up and grow. Mycorrhizal fungi fill a niche there, again, with the root systems of plants. Uh, right below there, the next trophic layer, there are the nematodes and the protozoa. They're consuming microbes that releases those minerals, that nutrition that plants can take up. And this whole scene, um, you know, I think of this as my team here at our farm. We're an apple farm and a medicinal herb farm. And my team, um, you know, it's a little arrogant to say this, but I'm the captain of the team because it's my farm. <laughs> um, but I really have one job as captain, and that's not to screw up my team. And if you keep that to your in the forefront of your mind, it's going to help direct you and some of the choices you can make in terms of where you're going. So this picture is a... Um, is the nutrient transfer mechanism of mycorrhizal fungi that penetrate into the roots. These are called arbuscules. And if you, if you just step back and look at that, you might think, well, that looks a lot like a tree, or maybe that looks like the feed a root system of a plant. Or if you've been trained medically, maybe it looks like the alveoli in our lungs where oxygen gets exchanged. In herbalism, there is an old tradition known as the doctrine of signatures, where the way something looks suggests its medicinal use. And when I look at these arbuscules, I'm really connecting, you know, tree, feed a root system, exchange of oxygen to the, the whole life process. So this is a really core thing that's going on. That was unfortunate. 
Okay, okay. So some of the advantages that mycorrhizae give to plants, give to living systems, uh, by being good guys, so to speak, they're gonna occupy the niche where disease organisms in the soil might have an opportunity to cause us problems. So that's a good point. I'm gonna really look at how mycorrhizae increase the nutrient reach um, in terms of getting more access to nutrients throughout the soil volume. Abetting plant metabolism is a really important point. So we're gonna spend a few slides on that just so we understand how healthy plants are different from unhealthy plants and how mycorrhizae play a role in that. Mycorrhizae are also involved because they're connecting both different fungal species and different plant species and sending signals. Uh, one example of that is if plants in this corner of the farm or the garden are suddenly dealing with aphids and there seems to be an outbreak occurring, the signal will go out throughout that plant community. So other plants will not only prepare phytochemically, but they'll actually send off signals to attract beneficial insects that are gonna deal with the aphids. Um, they also, the fungi play a role in inducing the disease resistance response. And when you add all that up, we're, we're talking about ecosystem resiliency in a big way. So this, this fungal plant thing is, is really at the heart of a healthy ecosystem. And one other little thing, um, not so little, fungi are very much involved in tucking away carbon in the soil. And for those of you who are growers, be it gardeners or row crop farmers or, or whatever, um, we know that you know one of our primary goals is to build soil tilth, to add organic matter to the soil. And, and that is accomplished by the fact that soil aggregates are formed around the roots. And you know, I often think oh, I'm doing a good job. I'm seeing good aggregation in my garden or out there in the orchard. Um, but it's really the fungi that do that. And they do that by means of lamellin, which is this protein-like glue that is secreted by the fungi, which binds the silt and the sand and the clay particles together. So you're gonna get more soil aggregation by supporting that fungal system in your soil. So just in terms of, of setting planetary norms, approximately 95% of the plants on earth want this affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. In, in the course of evolution, some plants lost this. So the broccolis, anything in the, uh, the cabbage family, um, things like pigweed, um, red beet, Swiss chard, amaranth, well, that's pigweed. Um, they don't have it, but most plants do. This is the normal way which plants get their nutrition. And, and we've circumvented that with a lot of our NPK thinking, but I just wanna, I wanna hold on to that point. This is the normal way that plants get their nutrition. So let me introduce two different groups of mycorrhizal fungi. There's several, but the two major ones, the first are what are known as ectomycorrhizae, E-C-T-O, that preface indicates that these are the fungi that affiliate with the trees of the forest, both softwoods and hardwoods. And they don't actually penetrate into the cell, but they form almost like fingers fitting into a tight glove around the feeder roots of the trees. These are fungi that we can actually see with our eyes. Um, these are fungi whose fruiting bodies are edible gourmet mushrooms, things like chanterelles and matsusaki. And the one point I wanna make about the ectomycorrhizae is they have what are known as explorer hyphae. And those hyphae can reach as much as 12 feet away to bring nutrients back to the plant. So the, the whole basis of this trade between fungi and plants is that fungi cannot photosynthesize, they cannot produce the carbon sugars, which are energy for the fungi. And so the plants trade that to the fungi in exchange for nutrients that the fungi can bring the plant. Then the other major group are what are known as endomycorrhizal fungi. And it's the endotypes that actually penetrate within, that's what that preface means, within the cell. They're, these are the ones that form the arbuscules. And if, if, if my arm here was a feeder root system, I would be able as a root all on my own to be able to get nutrients from what the groundwater brings to me. And it has to get within about, let's say three quarters of an inch of the surface of that root. But when I'm colonized by endomycorrhizal fungi, 
three to four inches around me is filled with hyphae that now can access nutrients from a little further away. And, and that idea of, of extending the feed of root reach through the fungal hyphae um, gets magnified many times over by the fact that different plants, different fungal species are gonna form connections to bring nutrients from even further away. Now, back in the 1920s, um, Rudolf Steiner gave some lectures in, in, in Austria and these are what became the basis of what we know as biodynamic farming. Not going into that concept at all, but at the time, people were becoming aware of mycorrhizal fungi, but they had a hard time distinguishing that this probably was a good thing for plants. Um, we had just had the microscope for maybe 20 some years that we could actually see those arbuscules within the roots. But Steiner talked about how the plants, the roots would mesh and form a coherent system, a, a, a network. And he called this the common root bean. And, and I like that term. Today, scientists talk about the common mycorrhizal network. And the idea here is that different plants, um, some will affiliate with one type of fungi, um, others another type of fungi, some of those fungi will unite those different subgroups and eventually it becomes really a whole, basically a shopping district in terms of nutrient sharing and, and these benefits that mycorrhizae offer within a plant community. Um, this is a picture of my orchard here in Northern New Hampshire. And you know, you don't see apple trees necessarily in a straight line in an herbicide strip with a little bit of grass in between. I mean, I'm a carpenter, I, I could plant them in a straight line, <laughs> but the, the point here is, is that there's all kinds of plant diversity and it's that plant diversity making that plant community that makes possible many more things rather than just isolated apple trees and an herbicide strip. Uh, and among them is just the ability to resist disease, which is a big thing when you're growing tree fruit. Um, well, for many plants. So the way this works, uh, just thinking in terms of what many of us understand, plants have sap. Um, that sap is both inside the plant cells in the cytoplasm and the protoplasm, but it's also in the intracellular spaces. Similarly, fungi have sap, um, not quite the same way, but it's, it's that protoplasm. It's that shared protoplasm where nutrients can go one way or the other. There can actually be a bi-directional flow going through this fungal hyphae, taking carbon down to the hyphal tip and bringing nutrients back to the plant. Um, and it, it's really a marvel to contemplate all this, how it works. Now, fungi carry forward by means of spores. Uh, and understanding a little bit about propagal nuance can be helpful as a grower in terms of how do I manage this fungal aspect of my soil, of my farm, of my gardens. So in the growing season itself, those fungal hyphae are reaching out, meeting new plant friends, forming affiliations, going further and further. So as, as a system is not disturbed, it's been planted, that fungal ecosystem is gonna to start to expand and grow the mycelium. That mycelium, that hyphae, is going to overwinter in root fragments. And those root fragments, kind of an important teaching. You know, whenever we clean up our gardens, if we pull out the tomato plants and rip out the beans or the peas after we've harvested the crop, um, we're essentially pulling out the hyphae as well. So learning to, to do what you do in a way that you can keep those roots in the ground is an important way to go through the winter, the dormant period for the fungal hyphae to be in place for the new crop that's going to come. And then beyond that, um, fungi form spores. And in the case of endomycorrhiza fungi, these spores are totally an underground thing. Um, they don't like sunshine and they don't move around very fast, which is quite different from what we find in the forest with ectomycorrhizae. So this is a poisonous pigskin puffball. And when that puffball lets go of its spores, um, they're adapted to sunlight. They have little spurs. They can be carried on the wind and recolonize an area. Well, with endomycorrhizae, 
if there's been a lot of soil degradation, if, if things have been done to harm the fungi, that comeback isn't quite as quick. And, and that's where commercial inoculum can be really useful. Um, you know, you have different crop rotations going on and, and we could be talking farm scale, we could be talking garden scale, we could be talking about um, dipping um, bare root systems of a, a new orchard to be in mycorrhizal fungi to get this in place. But through these commercial inoculums, we can introduce some of the primary players. And when I buy an inoculum product, I am definitely looking for those that have a mix of species, typically it's about nine endomycorrhizal species um, in the good ones. So this is things like myco apply and bioorganics. If you're in Canada, root rescue. Uh, and there are powdered formulations, there are soluble formulations, different practicalities of how you can work with this. Um, sometimes I, I buy the inoculum that has a gel and you see this um, root system of an apple tree and, and endomycorrhizae we cannot see with our eye. So I like to just kind of fool myself at this point, but it's, I can see that gel. I, I can feel like, yep, I'm, I'm not just planting a tree. I'm launching a fungal ecosystem here. So in a, a well healed, healthy ecosystem, there are going to be anywhere from 20 to as many as 50 different species of fungi involved in that plant community. And with endomycorrhizae, there's only some 400 species all told worldwide. So a lot of these players work in different um, climate zones. It's the same fungi, um, different plants, different climate, but the same fungi often. So to enhance fungal diversity um, means that we're going to have these 20 to 50 players who have different skill sets. Some, well, most all mycorrhizal fungi are really adept at bringing phosphorus to the plant. Uh, there may be the zinc specialist, there may be the manganese specialist. There'll be fungi that get a better start in cold soils early in spring. And, and you need those different skill sets to make a really good team effort. Um, one of the players, um, well, not one of the players, there's three specific fungi that'll be in these fungal inoculum products that are really adept at moving water throughout the ecosystem. So when we think about some of the, the dry periods we've been having, or, or just picture how a desert gets started, it's not just that plants disappeared, it's that the fungal element disappeared. And to restore life to those more barren areas, it's, it's not just about watering green plants, it's also about the fungal piece and having things like Glomus desicola and Glomus Masse involved in that ecosystem that you're planting. That was a little break by the uh, golden retriever. You probably all heard her. Um, for those of you who are growing blueberries in your, your garden and you, and you know that blueberries require a lot of water, they have a shallow root system. Blueberries also have a special fungal partner and the Ericaceae mycorrhizae um, are not something that we have put into a product, but often nine out of 11 peat moss samples will contain ericacea. Now here in the Northeast, I know I can go out to where wild low bush blueberries are growing, gather some soil, bring it back to my blueberries to make sure I have that in place. I'm just adding this to the talk for those of you who haven't been quite successful. It might be simply because you're missing the right fungal partner for those blueberries. Now, this evolution across biological kingdoms um, is pointing relentlessly to cooperation and support networks as the way life works. And, you know, one of the things in Rachel Carson's time, there was an ecologist named Frank Egler, and he said exactly what I feel when I contemplate this. Frank said, nature is not more complicated than we think. Nature is more complicated than we can think. And I'm fine with that. I'm a pretty humble guy about all this. Uh, I'm just awed by how beautiful all these, uh, what seem like little pieces, little life forms come together to make the big picture possible. So let's dive into the plant side of this. Um, we, we think of whatever crop we're growing as it's out in the sunshine, we might need to give it a little bit of water. Um, otherwise, and 
we'll, we'll add some fertilizer and maybe we're organic minded and understanding how important organic matter is in that picture. But for the most part, plants are out there in the sunshine and things are happening and, and we don't really have much say in that. Well, we do have a bigger role than we think. So a crop plant is going to typically have a photosynthesis efficiency on the order of 20 to 25 percent. Uh, there are cloudy days. There's, there's many reasons for this, but, but one of the things that holds plant back is not having access to balanced nutrition. And what's particularly important here are the trace minerals. So I'm talking now about things like manganese and boron and iron and copper and zinc. And these are the components of enzymes that are going to enhance the plant metabolism process. And let's quickly run through what plant metabolism is all about. But if, if those trace minerals are there and we get just a little bit more robust photosynthesis, amazing things happen. Now, part of the way that plants get minerals, uh, this is a mycorrhizal kind of sidebar, is that the fungi work in partnership with bacteria. So even though while I'm talking today about the fungal element of the soil food web, the bacterial piece is really, really important too. These bacterial partners, uh, in the case of what I call the bacterial bore, at the end of that explorer hyphae, the endomycorrhizae, is secreting carbon sugars it got from the plant. Those carbon sugars wash back along the hypha length, feeding bacteria who produce organic acids, which can literally bore into bedrock and release minerals that the fungal hyphae can then take back to the plant. Um, bacteria do the same thing. They solubilize phosphate, um, in phosphate rock in the soil, which the fungi cannot do, but that's how the plant gets phosphorus from the fungi because bacterial partners are involved there. Um, one of the, sorry, one of the things I utilize is, is fascinating knowledge that there are certain trees, what are known as the so-called soft hardwoods, things like willow and alder and popple. Um, pawpaws might be in that group, soft maple might be in that group, um, silver maple's probably in that group. But anyway, when they grow within several hundred feet of the orchard trees that I'm growing, they don't necessarily have to be right tight to it because the mycorrhizal network is sharing a lot of these nutrients. When they grow in that vicinity of, of the trees I'm growing, that's one of the ways minerals get supplemented. So that, that idea of polyculture, and I'm going to come back to that in kind of a, a Great Plains way um, in a little bit. Um, it's fascinating to realize Plant diversity, this is a specific example of how plant diversity is creating fungal diversity, which means that the pool of nutrients is that much broader, that much deeper. So plants go on from photosynthesis, they produce those glucose, the simple sugars. Those sugars are combined with nitrogen. Uh, this is what forms amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Now, protein synthesis can be complete and the protein gets embedded in the, the membrane cell wall, um, or it can be incomplete and there's more amino acids in the sap. Well, guess what? A lot of the foliar pests, uh, caterpillars, aphids, anything that feeds on green foliage are doing so because those are plants that haven't had complete protein synthesis. Similarly, the fungal spotting diseases are feeding off of those amino acids found in the sap because metabolism wasn't taking the building blocks and putting them away, storing them away. And, and that's really the explanation for why some trees are gonna see disease or insect pressure in a much bigger way. Um, that really drives an understanding of what's that difference between a healthy and an unhealthy plant. It's really about protein synthesis. And there we could be talking about, do we have adequate sulfur in the soil? Um, is nitrogen being delivered in the right form? A lot of things we could go to, but I just planting that idea that if the food isn't there for the pests and for the disease, the pests and the disease are not gonna be there on your crop. I keep pushing that wrong button, sorry. Fat energy is really important. Um, when we have cloudy rainy periods, that's when fungal disease really takes off. 
And if plants have invested in lipids, uh, in fat synthesis, they have energy to put back out into the plant sap to get through that period when infection pressure is higher. And, and plants can metabolize three to four times more fatty compounds if photosynthesis is robust. You, you get this idea, it's all kind of building on itself. Plants go on from there to produce what are known as secondary plant metabolites. I like to use the term resistance metabolites, but here we're talking about the phenolic compounds, terpenoids, flavonoids, alkaloids, all the things that herbalists like my wife, Nancy, get excited about um, for human medicine. Well, they're plant medicine. These are the phytochemicals by which plants are resisting diseases and higher order insects. And they're not there in abundance if plant metabolism isn't robust. And the big tie-in, again, is that notion that there's a wide availability of trace minerals in the right form, in reduced form. But in addition, that plants are getting their food in partially built form. And, and this is where we really break from NPK thinking. The notion that plants only take up soluble ions is wrong. Plants can take in amino acids, plants can absorb bacteria, take nutrients from those bacteria, spit the bacteria back out. Um, many ways that this takes place, and one way of thinking about it is, is pre-digestion in the soil by the microbes is much like what happens in the rumen of a cow. Um, and partially built forms of nutrition, whole foods, if you will, means that the plant has more reserve energy to do metabolism in a more robust fashion. Mycorrhizal fungi play right into this. Those arbuscules that I showed you earlier exist on the order of three to seven days. And then the hyphal system shuts them off and the arbuscules themselves, which are filled with proteins, filled with uh, phospholipids, filled with, um, that's fat energy, filled with calcium, dissolve into the plant sap, delivering nutrients to the plant in partially built form, you know, that's probably like the best nutrition the plant can get. This is what mycorrhizae are doing. So I, I put a lot of energy into like talking about fungal ascendancy in the soil, you know, how we farm, how we garden, how we orchard, um, providing the right kinds of organic matter to make it possible for the fungi to thrive means that I in turn, am gonna have that much healthier of a crop. So we've been talking about mycorrhizal fungi, um, and I mentioned sapotrophic fungi that break down organic matter. But really, for maybe the last hundred years, we've kind of obsessed on the very lower last grouping here on this list, which are the parasitic and pathogenic fungi, the fungi that cause disease. And, and they're maybe 3% of the fungal kingdom. For all this other part of the fungal kingdom supports life supports what we're doing. And when we fell into that mindset of spraying fungicides to deal with that small portion, we actually sabotaged a lot of the good chunk that's gonna make things possible for what we're trying to do. This is just a, a, a quick example, but I'm always fascinated by going into the depths. So, so one of the diseases that can afflict apple is what's called cedar apple rust. And cedar apple rust shares an affiliation with junipers and eastern red cedar. Um, you will see this in Kansas if you're growing fruit, maybe. And what's fascinating is that disease spore lands on the underside of the leaf and actually goes in through the stoma, in through the respiratory opening on the underside of the leaf. And when you start to realize that, um, it, it leads to... Um, what I call an opportunity to do something with other microbes. And so part of my holistic spray in the orchard, you know, I'm not spraying fungicides, I'm spraying nutrients, I'm spraying biology. And the role of the biology is to reinforce surface microbes, the arboreal um, food web, if you will, so that that stoma is now surrounded by fungi. Uh, those would be single celled yeasts and all kinds of beneficial bacteria, which protect the niche from the rust fungi getting in. So I just wanted to drop into a deeper little place briefly to give you an example of, of how some of these things tie together. 
So our whole idea of thinking about spray medicines um, to deal with insects and to deal with all sorts of diseases and all sorts of crops, um, they're really made necessary by the fact that there's some sort of biological or nutritional deficiency at play with the crop that we're growing. And when we shift that mindset, boy, does things shift in terms of what we can do to grow healthy food. So one of the other aspects of this is what I call green immune function. This is the phytochemistry, that whole plant metabolism thing. And then there's two legs to this. What's known as systemic acquired resistance involves plants reality, dealing with the fact that some diseases spores do land and try to penetrate into the leaf. An aphid takes a chomp here or a caterpillar takes a chomp there. Um, and it's that slight pressure that triggers a defensive response by the plant. That's important, you know. If I grow my crops in a fungicide cloud, they're not gonna experience that. They're not gonna have that inner fortitude. The other leg of this is what is known as induced systemic resistance. And with this aspect, what I spray on the tree, be it other microbes, be it nutrients, be it certain herbal remedies, um, is gonna induce that response. Similarly, down below in the soil, we have the mycorrhizal fungi, which are penetrating into the roots of the plant. Well, a pact was made between those fungal species and the plant, not to reject the fungi as a disease, but the plant still goes through kind of the process of like, ooh, something's entering me. I need to respond phytochemically and it boosts its defenses. Um, it's all, works out copacetically between the mycorrhizal fungi and the plant. But, but that little boost is also part of the plant priming itself for whatever the environmental reality brings. So when I'm out there with my sprayer, um, and I have a tractor sprayer, this is just a, a book picture. Um, and that spray tank is filled with nutrients and filled with biology, all these things I'm processing. And what drips to the soil because it's not a fungicide, it's not killing the mycorrhizal fungi, it's not having a war on the other 95% of the fungal kingdom, it's enhancing it. The, the fats and neem oil, caranja oil, some of the seed oils I use, and I'm just starting to play with hemp oil. I mean, it, this is fun stuff. Um, but what I'm doing is tying with, in with how nature does health. And many of us can figure out better ways to do that as well. You know, the driving force behind my growing, my thinking, when I am making decisions of managing the apple crop, managing the medicinal herb crops, is how can I enhance photosynthesis? And by having that in my mindset as my driver, the, the thing I most want to achieve, um, it leads me to doing the kinds of steps that are gonna help achieve that. This is a picture of my wife, Nancy. Nancy's from um, North Central Kansas, Belleville. So I don't know if anyone out there is listening, but if you knew Nancy Spannenberg in high school, um, this is her. Anyway, photo op for the books again, but here I was articulating what I call the non-disturbance principle. And, and this is a, like, a lot like what uh, Aldo Leopold talked about in terms of we humans need to recognize we're not the kingpin. We're just a member of a community. And as a good member of the community, a good steward of the land, we want to be aware of, of well, starting off with gratefulness. I, I think gratefulness is a very important place to be in. Um, but beyond that, be aware of ways we might screw up. Uh, excessive tillage, um, NPK fertilization works against the biological connection, herbicides very much so. Um, and not do those things learn to figure out a way to do it better. And that's where we get into doing what I say, let's do fungal things, let's do more fungal things, things that enhance these connections I've been talking about. And by doing so, we will honor the earth. Now, Bill Mollison, who really launched the whole permaculture um, thinking, talked maybe 30 some years ago about how we really have to get it together, the human species and give our young 
people a chance to restore these degraded lands. We have to start learning how rotational grazing fits into this picture and, and uh, no-till farming, all these things that are going on here and there, we need to just start doing in a much bigger way because time is running out. I mean, the, the big thing in our favor is the fact that mycorrhizal fungi um, are doing the right thing. I've been there all along. And as, as we make them our friends, as we put them at the fore of our consciousness, we in turn become better stewards. And that's why I'm here today. I'm not out working in my orchard because I have this opportunity to talk to you and, and hopefully inspire some of the things that you can do. So let's, let's delve into a few practicalities in the little time that we have left. Um, and let's just start with this notion of, well, when might we inoculate, um, introduce mycorrhizal fungi? I'm, I'm not someone who's telling you to buy a product every year and use products. I wanna do it wisely. So one great opportunity, anyone who starts your own seedlings, your own transplants, um, that tomato seed, that pepper seed, the herb seeds, whatever it is that you're growing in your greenhouse, well, you've mixed up potting soil. Maybe you make your own, maybe you purchase it. Often it will not have the mycorrhizal inoculum in the purchased product. The ones that do will have just one species. I, I wanna do something more with that. So I introduced mycorrhizal inoculum, a few tablespoons in that bin of potting soil, because I know that's going to introduce nine different players, some of which are going to connect with that tomato plant. So by the time it gets planted out in the field, some six, eight weeks later, um, it's going to have fungal friends and plants in place. It's going to transplant that much better, and it's going to have that jump start. Mycorrhizal spores in the soil have to be within about an eighth of an inch of the root to germinate, to form that connection. So the roots eventually find their way and, and find some of those spores. But when we're doing a crop plant, what an opportunity to introduce it right from the get-go. Similarly, I will dust potato eyes before I put the dirt back up and form the hills. I'll dust the garlic cloves that I'm planting in the fall. There's, there's many ways to do it as a home gardener that is, are simple and direct and making sure that things are in place to begin with. Um, this whole concept that trees and perennial systems are more fungal and the garden is more of a bacterial place, well, that's wrong. Um, remember, 95% of the plants on earth have this affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. And that's the norm. And many of the things we grow in our gardens want to have those fungal friends. Now, this, this is a, a way of looking at soil life in terms of the biomass of, of, of the fungal component of the soil food web and the bacterial component. And when we are dealing with a place where the topsoil has been scraped or there's just unrelenting tillage or regular use of herbicides, we're, we're looking at the bacterial biomass being much greater than the fungal biomass. Conventional no-till folks aim to have those fungal and bacterial biomass be equal on the order of one to one. And the fact that they use herbicides to create that system um, means no disturbance of the soil with respect to mechanical tillage, but the herbicides constantly are knocking back parts of the soil life. And so it, it's, it's an achievement to get it to be one-to-one. -one. And it involves cover cropping and, and, and being a, a steward of the land all 12 months of the year, not just your crop cycle, but also when things are fallow having cover crops, having green plants there as much as you can all the time. Well, when you get into what I call biological quasi-till, I'm not, I'm not going to totally rule, rule out tilling. There may be that every two, three years you need to do a shallow till to get in a cover crop seed. Maybe you're using vertical tines. There's, it's not just black and white. There's, there's a gray area in between. But by eliminating the use of the herbicides, you're gonna to start to see that fungal biomass be a little bit more than the bacterial biomass. Now in the orchard, working with trees, with perennials, I'm looking for that fungal biomass to be on the order of 10 to one to the bacterial biomass. 
actually emulating what we find on the edge of the forest. There's this transition. And when you get into the old growth forest, it's very much a fungal haven. The fungal biomass is a hundred times greater than the bacterial. But, but you get this idea of, of we, we need to be giving some thought to how can we preserve more of the fungal for the kind of cropping that we're doing so that we take in these many different advantages I've been talking about. So we have a, a like I said, a medicinal herb farm. We grow our own ver vegetables and I cover crop to leave some parts of the garden fallow some years and other years we'll crop there. And when I grow the rye and vetch um, and it goes into flower and seed, I will come through with a flail mower on my PCS and I will leave it be as surface stubble. You know, I'm not tearing into the soil and I can literally come in and sow oats and some other fall crops that will grow up through that mulch layer, again, without disturbing the soil. Uh, and, and this is one of the ways that is very practical for me to work with a really high volume organic matter cover crop like rye and vetch, and yet be able to stay on top of it and get all the advantages in place while keeping the mycorrhizal fungi happy. Those weeds that proved to be the most biggest problems for growers tend to be non-mycorrhizal. The relevance of this, so talking about things like um, pigweed, um, goosefoot, the relevance of this is that these are plants that set lots of seeds. So the pr one practicality is, you know, mow, so we don't have seeds being set to keep restoring that seed load in the soil. But another practicality, as we start to get things more fungal, is plants that are going to accept those arbuscules, bringing nutrients to them in exchange for carbon, are going to start to have a leg up on anything that doesn't have fungal friends. And this is what shifts what's going on in terms of the plants that are going to grow in that soil. And, and you'll see, you're getting greater soil aggregation. Um, your organic matter levels are going up. The fungi are in place and continuing for the next crop. It's just not going to be a place that the non-mycorrhizal plants are going to thrive. It's in those degraded soils where this happens. Um, so there's a lot involved with that slide, but, but just wanted to plant that seed in your head. Now, another thing is, is starting to think in terms of plant diversity in ground where you're mostly planting annuals, but having things like the strawberry bed, a raspberry bed, within your garden area, asparagus bed is another example, where you're not going to be disturbing the soil and you're essentially creating fungal refuges, which the fungi can reach out from and become part of the colonization of the plants that you're growing. You know, what's beautiful to me, this idea of diversity strips uh, when you're growing corn, soybean, for those of you who are doing this, you know, this, this is not just about diversity above supporting lots of different beneficial insects. This is also about supporting diversity below. So you have more species of both bacterial and fungal species with access to the crops. Um, they're not gonna reach all the way into the, the middle of those rows, but there's gonna be edge effects and it's going to reach in further than we think. And um, so just planting that seed of diversity above represents diversity below. The more we can create a diverse plant community, the better what we're trying to do is going to happen. So one of the things that were really exciting to me, I, I came a couple of years ago and spoke to the no-till farmers on the plains at their winter conference. I met lots of amazing growers and people were talking about these cover cop cocktails, the idea that having lots of different plants in that mix really seemed to do something magical for the soil, um, for both the crop being grown, but the plant residues after that feed the soil for the next crop. And also intercropping is another big part of this. But again, it's, it's all under that banner of plant diversity. A few years before that, I had heard Christine Jones, who's a soil ecologist from Australia, talking about plant quorum sensing at an acres conference. And what she described was, again, this notion that having plant diversity means more species can be grown, more species of biology are gonna be supported in the soil. And there's a point 
where things all fall in place, where the symphony begins, because there's enough diversity. And she talked about this research that was done in South Dakota, I believe, uh, with triticale. And triticale, the grain was planted by itself. It was a very dry summer and was not going to head up. There wasn't really going to be a crop. No irrigation was being introduced. Triticale was planted with one, two or three different cover crops interplanted. Same thing, crop going nowhere. With four, five, six, seven different cover crop species, same thing, crop going nowhere. But the plot with eight other cover crop companions looked as lush and as green as could be and the crop was heading up and it was gonna be a successful harvest. And, and that's just a kind of a, it's not that the number eight is the magic thing, but in the case of that particular plant with the eight chosen partners, there was enough biology diversity supported to make plant magic happen. So <coughs> all these different teachings, you know, we, we're also familiar with notion of, of windbreaks and shelter breaks and um, different plants in your riparian zones. Well, again, it, it's like those fungal refuges I described in the garden. This is good farming. This is good stewardship. And it's because we're making it possible for the fungal dynamic to remain in place, be diverse, and have an impact on the crop that we're growing. We're forming the common root being by the choices we make above ground. That's that common mycorrhizal network that the scientists talk about. So besides being a fungal steward, you know, our other chief job as growers is really comes down to the flow of organic matter. Um, and foremost among that is utilizing living plants. That's the cover crop idea. Um, using surface decomposition rather than disturbing the roots where the hyphae are gonna overwinter. Um, introducing animals into systems, manure on the move. And then of course you can make compost. Um, I use a lot of what are called ramial wood chips in my orchard, which are the smaller portion of deciduous trees, which really are like a casba for fungi uh, to build soil. So these things that we can do, but really at the top of that pyramid is working with living plants because living plants, oops, there we go again. Living plants are the partner of those fungal allies in the soil, what we've been calling, identifying today as mycorrhizal fungi and the root words of that term mycorrhizae, meaning fungus root, it takes two to tango. Understanding that means that we in turn are working with nat natural systems to get carbon into that soil, to build healthy ecosystems that are gonna produce food for us, the humans, um, but also support wildlife and all the other species. You know, this is a picture of my garden in the fall. And it's, it's one of my favorite cover crop combinations for late, autumn, early September planting. And it, it consists of oats, field peas, and tillage radish. Not a big mix, but all plants that are going to winter kill. The tillage radish goes deep into the soil. It's a brassica, so it doesn't have a mycorrhizal fungal affiliation, but it's gonna help break up compaction. The oats, a cereal grass, our grasses tend to have the most fungal partners. So definitely want that going on and field pea, some kind of legume fixing nitrogen through the rhizobacteria. Um, this just leaves me with this beautiful dead mulch, all these root fragments in the soil to plant into come the following spring. And it's, I call it biological tillage, but you get the idea as you start to understand the nuance of the fungi, of the plants, anticipate your crop rotations, how you work in your garden, getting that cover crop, getting something green and living, photosynthesizing throughout all the seasons of the year when plants will grow. That's how you do the best job you can to be the captain of that team, that soil food web that we talked about in the beginning. Rachel Carson, again, wrote the book Silent Spring, uh, kind of exposed the whole DDT scam with respect to what were happening to the birds and to other life for other species. Talked about contemplating the beauty of the earth, finding reserves of strength to endure as long as life lasts. You know, 
I'm doing really serious things as a, as a fruit grower, as a medicinal herb farmer. Uh, you're all doing really serious things, but you're also working with the most incredible dynamic there is on this planet. Um, you're a partner to the fungi and a, a steward of green plants. And what a thing to do. What a way to spend our days knowing that we're helping the earth do what the earth needs to do. So there'll be many generations to come. You know, hopefully in this kind of really quick dive into the fungal realm, um, I've revealed to you a little bit of a notion of, of what's going on. So you in turn can take that idea, learn a little bit more, start thinking about how can I be more fungal in my life? Um, because it's the plants and the mycorrhizae together, working together that are gonna keep this planet a living planet and make it possible for us to continue to call this special place our home. So let's go into some questions and see where people have gone with all this. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, we're open, happy for your questions at this point. Um, Antelion uh, wrote in the chat about a wind windbreak project in the works. I don't know if you want to talk about that, uh, Antelion. All right. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. sorry, sorry to call you out. Um, Robin says, where do we get the inoculant? Do you have uh, suppliers or places you would recommend? So different um, agricultural supply houses have this. Um, you know, Seven Springs Farm in Virginia comes to mind. Um, wherever you can get Valent products, they bought Michael Apply. Um, Bioorganics has its own website. You know, I order a three pound jar. There's also a one and a half pound jar. Um, and mycorrhizal inoculum product, you know, not left in the sun, kept in a cooler place. You're gonna have two or three years of shelf life from that product in terms of spore viability and using it for what you want. Can go pretty far, um, you know, and, and without having gotten into it, you know, you may, as part of your crop rotation in, in a bigger field, you could introduce an inoculum to that seed drill uh, to a cover crop like sedan grass or any of the grasses, which again, have multiple affiliation on the get -go, so that your next crop, you're not necessarily inoculating that, but because you managed it correctly, you've kept the fungal potential in place and that's, that gets things back to square one so that you have that fungal piece going for you. Thank you. Um, Allison asked, will adding fungal dominated compost assist with the mycorrhiza? So that, that's a, a good question um, because it, it goes right back to my first slide. Mycorrhiza fungi are affiliated with the roots of plants. When we make compost, we're not growing plants. Um, maybe if it's a really old compost pile and you haven't used it, you might grow plants on it, but, but we're really not growing plants and we're turning it and we're generating bacterial heat and the fungal dominance is important. Um, the saprotrophic species are helping break down organic matter, but there is nothing to do with mycorrhizae in that compost pile. So, so fungal dominated compost is not a source of mycorrhizae. You know, one instance where it may be is if, the, if that pile is made on the edge of the woods and some of the roots of the trees get up into that pile because you're, you're letting it cool down and you're letting it really mature. Um, but, th but that's not the way to go about it. It's, it's through the roots of plants with fungal partners introduced that you get that. It's not gonna happen through the compost pile. So Daniel um, asks, your tips on things to do in planting uh, things was very helpful. What tips do you have for supporting already established plants and trees? So 
you know, whenever I do an orchard consultation, I, I want to understand a little bit about the history of that land. And similarly, the history of a farm field ties into this. And so you may have done some fungal things, introduced some fungal sorry, some fungal partners, um, but you only have a small piece of the diversity. Um, particularly, let's say you, you take over an orchard, which has been chemically, the fruit has been grown with chemicals uh, and you now wanna drop the chemicals and go to more holistic means. You know, to introduce more fungi to that perennial tree system can have a lot of value, but this, this ties into the history. I mean, I'm giving a specific here with chemical history. Um, Maybe you, you started your fruit trees in what was a monoculture corn crop um, field. And now you've been introducing organic matter. You have a few fungal species. You're starting to see more plants come back. You're introducing specific plants, be it comfrey or, or what have you. Um, it, it may be appropriate to use commercial inoculum. You can also grow your own inoculum on grass roots. That's detailed in the book. Um, you can also go out to wild ecosystems. And I like to ask permission when I'm taking, but to take some soil and, and, and take a pint or a quart and scrape away the mulch layer in the, around your fruit trees and put that down and then cover it back up because this is an underground species, the fungal species. You're gonna maybe snag some indigenous fungi that aren't a part of what you've done to date and enhance the diversity. Whether, you know, doing that for six or 12 trees is a lot easier than thinking about doing it for several acres of orchard. So there's practicalities that come into play here. Um, similarly, <clears throat> when I talked about very briefly, inducing that systemic resistance response, uh, and I include fatty seed oils, well, those fats feed mycorrhizal fungi and sapotrophic fungi. So if, if you're doing something to enhance photosynthesis, working with nutrients and biology, um, that's a way of, of, of feeding the system in a good way with the right kind of foods so that the result is healthy plant metabolism. Tom asks, what plants beside grasses have high propensities for myco relationships? What's fascinating to me is, is when I showed you that picture of the uh, different groupings of fungi, um, we, we know about 10, maybe 15% of, of the different species. We've given them names, started to learn a few of their traits, but mostly we don't know much. And I, I like to think of it as we're in kindergarten. So when I tell you something about how I saw in a research paper that Sudan grass has 50 known affiliations with different species of mycorrhizal fungi. I love that stuff. And, you know, it's, that's pointing to why I said grasses tend to have multiple affiliations. Um, almost any plant probably has several fungal partners if they're there, if they're present. And we haven't really delved deeply into that. You know, my, my thinking here is not so much to find all the reductionist facts but to recognize that the diverse plant community covers the bases. And I know that's not as satisfying as telling you specifically this plant and this plant and this plant, um, but it's the grasses, but just recognizing that, you know, a legume, you know, what goes on between grass and a legume? Well, with oats and clover, red clover, the oats have fungal partners that help them get more phosphorus. They direct some of that phosphorus to the legume <clears throat> not so much for the legumes purpose, but because the rhizobacter bacteria on the root of the legume need the phosphorus, which in turn allows them to produce more nitrogen, some of which goes back to the grasses. And, and, and we're just learning these things. We're in kindergarten. Um, so just get your, your head around plant diversity makes things happen and appreciate the grasses, but you need the other partners as well. And it's that team effort that produces the results. Thanks, Michael. Other questions? Uh, Jeanette, I see you mentioned your soil builder um, product. 
I don't know if you're are you wanting to talk about that, but uh, Adam has asked. Oh, go ahead, Janet. Trying to start my video, but I think I don't have enough uh, bandwidth. Um, so. Um, our soil organics product, it, it does, uh, we do decompose farm inputs. So hay and straw and manure and chicken litter. And, and in our decomposition process, it does uh, get to very high temperatures in order to um, eliminate the seeds and the bad microbes and bacteria. Um, but then we go through eight more weeks where we're inoculating with a number of different um, biology and fungal um, assets that are then built up in the soil along with building humus long chain carbons. Um, and so at the end of the 12 week process, we've got a really um, nice soil builder that has a lot of organic matter and it's been built up with a lot of the, the microbial community. Um, and so the combination there really helps uh, build the soil so that and we, we've seen a lot of examples where it really helps plants flourish. No, that sounds wonderful. And I'd be working with your product if I had it out here. You know, that, that's kind of an example, too, of the uh, there's lots of biology that can be supported in that organic matter by the, your understanding and your process. Um, but because plants can grow in there, mycorrhizae are not a part of it unless you go and introduce a spore inoculum, which right. that can be. Um, but again, so it's, it's understanding. Question. If we're introducing mycorrhizal fungi in, in an inoculant, is it going to sustain itself until it gets to the root or will it go dormant or will it just die? So those spores need a phytochemical signal from the root to germinate. That's why I talked about this need to get within about an eighth of, the, of an inch from the root. And if that signal isn't received, the spore lies dormant waiting. Right. And, and so a spore in the ground may be there for two or three plus years. Yeah. And if the opportunity didn't happen. It's still a viable spore. When I when right. I mentioned the irrigation mycorrhizae for blueberries and peat moss, now we're talking about spores that might go back hundreds of years mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of waiting for that opportunity. So, you know, from your perspective as a making this great organic product um, to build humus, you might introduce mycorrhizae because it has another marketing edge to it, or people are just aware that if they want that piece, that's gotten here and you have this piece. And yeah. that's, that's how these things come to be. Great. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Good um, Allison asks, is food grown in mycorrhizal rich soil more nutritious? Curious on Yay, that. Allison. Yeah. So my, my thoughts are absolutely yes, because what is nutritious food about? It's about nutrient density. Now, does that result because we go out and sprinkle magic rock powders? That helps, but it's, it's the biology processing with mineral amendments and mycorrhizal fungi are right at the fore of this, delivering nutrition in balanced form. You know, there's an, I mean, I use the word mycelium and plant community. There's an incredible intelligence going on there. Um, it isn't like the fungi are just saying, hey, everyone, free zinc today. It's, it's more over here, these plants need zinc. Let's direct that over there. And, and this is what I mean by balanced nutrition. And, and we barely comprehend this, but this is how nature, well, this is why a, an untouched natural ecosystem, you see this vibrancy, this green to it, uh, that balance has not been disturbed. Um, when we work with those principles in our garden and we have the fungal element in place as part of that soil food web team, our plants are getting that deep nutrition. And yes, they're gonna be more nutritious, but here's also another fascinating part. When those plants have dealt with environmental reality, a little bit of disease pathogens, a little bit of the insect presence, but it hasn't taken off, they produce phytochemicals. So when we talk about 
anthocyanins and antioxidants being good for us. Well, my apples have a lot more of that than those grown in the chemical system because those plants are denied that reality, that phytochemical process. And that's good for you. That's good for you. It's good for all of us.